Thanks everyone for coming. We have a nice big crowd in the Zoom room and a, a smaller crowd here. Um, so I'm happy to welcome Lauren Schneider. We are proud to claim Lauren here in WWU Olympic. Lauren graduated in, from Western in 2014 and then went uh, to get her MA at Trinity Western. Mm -hmm. And then um, is currently a PhD candidate at Simon Fraser University. So that means, for those of you who don't know, she's done everything but her dissertation, which she's working on now, and we'll get to hear about part of that. Um, so Lauren's interests lie in morphology and morphosyntax, primarily of the Salish languages, and in particular, Pokemenum, which she will talk to us more about. And Lauren's current interest is uh, focused on Alpha male and serial verb constructions, which we'll get to hear about. And so let us know, I'll be monitoring the, um, the Zoom. Um, we'll have questions at the end, both from the room, in-person room and the Zoom room, and I'll, I'll be taking care of that. So those of you on Zoom, let me know if you can't hear or see something, but otherwise, take it away, Lauren. Thanks everybody for coming. It's fun to be in person. Um, and let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Um, my voice doesn't carry very well, but um, it's a small room. And there's not too much going on. So um, as, uh, as, uh, as Kristen said, my name is Lauren, and I'm going to be talking about serial verbs um, in Hokumitnam. And so I want to start by making some quick acknowledgments. Um, I want to first res respectfully acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Um, and I'm indebted to all the elders who provided a list of data um, and texts for us to refer to. Um, and it's been an honor to work with them and their legacies. Um, and so a little bit about me, it's really fun to be back here. Um, I graduated as Christian said with my BA in linguistics. Um, and so there's a lot of fun memories here. I met my partner playing Frisbee on the rec turf. Um, while I was here, and I also found out what linguistics was. I hadn't ever heard of it before I uh, took my first class really. Um, and so and back then linguistics wasn't even a department, it was just nestled under the English department. And so it's been really cool to come back and see the, the, the whole other offices that are there now and the new faculty. And um, so that's been really fun. Um, and so after graduating Western, I quickly realized I needed to go back to school. Um, and that's where I've been since. Um, and finally I included a picture of my cat and this is him helping with my research. He's laying on a book on serial verbs. Um, okay, so the Salish languages are spoken kind of around the Salish Sea. Um, and so up and down the coast from, um, you can see up in the north, Bella Kula. Let me see my cursor right now. Okay, Bella Kula up in the north, um, all the way down to Tillamook in Oregon. Um, and then it extends as far east as Montana. The, the subgroup I'm talking about is Central Salish, which is just the coast of BC and Washington State. I'll zoom in a little further. Um, and then I'm specifically talking today about Halkamalam, which is one of those Central Salish languages. There are three main dialects, upriver, downriver, and island, or as they refer to themselves, Halkamalam, uh, Hunkamitnam, and Halkamitnam. Um, and so my research is on Halkamitnam, which is the island dialect, which is there in purple. Um, this presentation explores motion serial verb constructions. And so I just started by giving you a little example of what that looks like. Um, and so I will unpack that a lot over the course of this presentation, but I just want to start by playing one for you. Can you hear that one? Okay, it sounds a little bit. Um, Holcomitnam is no longer used in most homes, um, but it's used in ceremonies, longhouse work, and for telling stories. Um, daily in our in the Holcomitnam Language Academy, there's uh, people age zero to 99 uh, in classrooms using and learning the language. And so L2 speakers now are taking on the responsibility of carrying on the language to the next generation. But mastering authentic Holcomitnam is a daunting task due to interference from English, which is very different from Holcomitnam uh, phonologically, uh, morphologically, and syntactically. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit about the language community. Um, and then the research that we're working on, like, like, like this one, um, 
well, it's been a lot of time right now, especially because of COVID and text corpus. Um, there's, we have a 17,000 line text corpus of stories going back, uh, recordings from 1962, so, uh, like uh, elicited texts and videos. Um, and so that's where I started with my initial digging is kind of like looking for ways, uh, collecting sentences with multiple verbs in them and looking for like what happens a lot. Um, and so that's this presentation is about one of those patterns that happens a lot. And then once I, it's like, okay, this is what I see a lot of and then doing some testing to see what, what I can and cannot do. Um, and so that's with the sitting down with the elders and to looking for ungrammatical examples. And so pre-COVID that was traveling to Vancouver Island and sitting with elders and spending like a week at a time there. And now it's uh, it's more Zoom stuff. And so hopefully we'll get back to that in-person elicitation. But in the meantime, we can uh, go continue along um, with the technology that we have. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit more about the language in general, just gonna give a little context. Um, and then I'll kind of pivot into introducing what a serial verb is. Um, and then I'm gonna get, kind of zoom in on the specific type that we see in Holcomitnam and the things, the kinds of things we can learn from that data. So first, this is an inventory of Holcomitnam phonemes. Um, it's in the American phonetic alphabet. That's what most um, Americanists use for languages of the, uh, for the languages of the Americas. Um, and so the first thing I think is super interesting is that there's no, uh, like in the stops, there's no voicing contrast. So you don't get ta, ba, ta, da, ka, ga, you get, um, a plain glottalized contrast. And so, cause I'm not that good at producing them. I have some recordings to play, um, to try to like give you a, an idea of what that, that sounds like. So it's like they, they have an adjective that really kind of pops a little bit. I'll do a couple more. This one's really hard. And this one's a little, this one's a little more pronounced. So that's when they have that little extra pop, that's usually when they're trying to teach it where it like really pops like that. Um, and so this was clearly a case of her like saying in isolation, trying to make it really clear to the learner what she's doing. And that's one's a little bit more um, how natural. Um, and then the last one I wanted to show you is my, this became my favorite phoneme. It's a lateral fricative. <clears throat> and I just picked another word. So that one's pronounced like you would, um, like make it so they instead of <clears throat> this the lateral fricative you make an L shape and the air goes on either side of your tongue. Slow. So that's um it's a little bit about the phonology and then um and so and then I also wanted to include uh this is the phoneme chart but from the Holcomenum orthography. Um, the top line of each of my transcriptions is gonna have uh, a line of Holcomenum um, in the writing system. Um, and I include this line in my work as a reminder that this work is a partnership with the Holcomenum community um, and the Holcomenum people. And so as a reminder to keep, to keep my work accessible to, to these people, um, I always wanna make sure that the, there's, there's a line that they can read. <clears throat> since the, the American phonetic alphabet isn't always transparent. Um, and so this writing system is actually pretty straightforward and it's you know designed for English speakers to be able to learn easily. Um, and so if you have any questions about this, I can always come back to that in the question section. Um, and so a little bit about syntax, Holcomitna, like other Salish languages is predicate initial. What this means is the verb goes before the subject. So in an intransitive sentence like this, you have, um, an auxiliary, so nem shot pull, uh, so it is your verb, and then followed by the subject. Uh, in this case, my nephew. And then in a uh, tr in trans excuse me, transitive sentence, where you have subject and object, the basic word order is going to be verb, subject, object. So we have niquanitas, means to take, and then the subject is the man, and then the thing he's taking is the sockeye, and that goes last. 
Um, and then a little bit of morphology. Um, it's a synthetic language. Um, it has a large inventory of suffixes. And so you can get these big long words like this one, which is consists of a verb root, the date of a transitive, the object marking, subject marking, and then um, the reflexive marking as well. And so um, they have the potential for these big long uh, synthetic words. Um, okay, so, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about verb serialization, which hasn't been described thoroughly in any Salish language. So this is kind of serial verbs in the world's languages. It's a survey conducted by Ross 2015. Um, and the red dots are languages that have serial verb constructions and the blue dots don't. And so uh, we can see that uh, serial verb constructions are really common in Central Africa, like the Niger-Congo languages. They're really common in Southeast Asia. Um, and then they're also common in kind of the Austronesian, Polynesian region north of Australia. And then there's a sprinkling in North and South America, um, but I think it's a little understudied in this, these regions. It was first described in, to de, uh, the term was first used to describe languages um, in Niger Congo in Africa. Um, so what is, what is the serial verb construction? Um, so first I'll give you the kind of the dense uh, de definition. Um, it refers to a monoclausal construction with consisting of multiple independent verbs um, with no element linking them. And so first I wanted to start by giving a couple English examples of what is not a serial verb. So um, in example A, I went fishing. I have two verby things. Um, but um, they're right next to each other, so maybe does this count? Um, but no, because here, fishing is not a verb, it's a gerund, which matters because English doesn't allow two fully inflected verbs to occur next to each other. Um, we can, uh, <clears throat> as we can see in B, like I constructed an ungrammatical uh, example, I went fished. All of us agree that that's uh, not a good English sentence. Um, and so, and we can also tell that fishing is more of a nouny thing. Um, rather than a verby thing, because it can function as the subject of the clause. Um, and whether or not you agree, fishing is boring, I mean, you would agree that's a grammatically correct um, sentence. Um, another kind of verb verb construction we have in English is verb verb compounds like dropkick. Um, and we can, and these also don't count as serial verbs. So in the same way, I can't went fished, I also can't dropped kicked the ball. So because I can't put that inflection on both, um, that's kind of a hint that this isn't quite the same thing. And so the same way I can, I can stir fry something, I can't stirred fried something. And so since I can't inflect both members with past tense, that's a good hint that these are um, uh, not a serial word. Um, and then kind of this like independent verbs language um, another way we can kind of show this is that um, we can see that each of these verbs, so like in A, you get meet sent haye, um, where you've got it, it haye is the main verb of the clause, and then you've got meet sent shakul, or shakul is the main verb of the clause. Um, and then you can also put them together in a kind of combinatorial way meet sent haye shakul. And finally, um, part of the definition is that you can't have a linking element between them. And so what that uh, boils down to is usually, so if there's any sort of co coordinating or subordinating um, conjunction between the two verbs, we're gonna exclude any of those types of constructions. So the, in this English example, sorry to eat and run, not a serial verb because I've got and. Um, and so if you're not already sold on why this sort of work is important, I wanted to give you a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, this is a feature that is vulnerable to loss because the responsibility of carrying on the whole Kaminum language is shifting to a generation who largely due to the effects of the residential school system um, did not grow up speaking whole And so for these English speakers who are now trying to reclaim their heritage language, um, these, these constructions that are very different from English can be harder to acquire. And so one of my goals is that by researching and analyzing these structures, I hope to not only contribute to the field of linguistics, but also generate resources that these learners can refer to. Um, and the second reason, and this is more of a linguistics reason, um, Hulka Meetnam is particularly interesting 
um, when talking about ser verb serialization, is it's a kind of language that we actually wouldn't expect to see verb serialization in. Um, and so I'm going to unpack that next. With some so I'm going to start with some definitions. So analytic languages are uh, languages like Chinese, where most of the words consist of either one or two morphemes. And synthetic languages are ones where they have higher morph morpheme to word ratio. So like that example of hokuminum with that big long word, that's a synthetic language or a polysynthetic language. Um, and so first I just wanted to like look at some more familiar languages. To, um, so you've got ones like at the top, like West Greenlandic, which has the ratio of morphemes per word is closer to four. And so that, that's gonna be a more synthetic language all the way down to Vietnamese at the bottom, which really prefers to just have one morpheme per word. And that's gonna be an isolating, okay, an analytic language. Um, and analytic languages are actually much more likely to have serial verbs um, than synthetic languages are, which makes sense because if you're only allowed to have one morpheme per word, so one meaning unit per word, um, stacking multiple verbs allows you to give more nuance in describing your events. So um, the kind of things that we expect to see for serializing languages typologically is that they're analytic or isolating, so one or two morphemes per word, um, and that they're also that they're verb final or verb medial. Um, and this is just a, a pattern in the world's languages. And so whole communum is different from what, like the, what we would typologically expect in that it's more synthetic, meaning it can pack more morphemes in, um, and that it uh, also puts the verb at the beginning of the clause, which makes a messy syntactic puzzle. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that one today. And then the next uh, param parameter I wanted to talk about was contiguous, I forgot how to say that word, contiguous, cont contiguity, there we go, we got there. Um, and basic, and this sounds similar, it's similar in sound and meaning to continuity, um, which means it's uninterrupted. And so contiguous SVCs do not allow any other constituents to occur between the verb components. And so analytic languages have two options. They tend to have multi-word SVCs, um, while synthetic languages have single word constructions. And then analytic languages, those multi-word SVCs can either be uninterrupted by another constituent or they can um, be interrupted. So contiguous or non-contiguous. I have some examples to illustrate that. Um, so this example is from Tetan Dili, which is an Austronesian language speak, spoken in East Timor. Um, there's a, so this is an example of a contiguous multi-word SVC, because you've got two verbs, run and ascend, um, and there's nothing intervening between the verb components. So this, this one is continuous. Um, and so, and then in contrast, um, so here's another Austronesian language, Taba. Um, and here we have another multi-word SVC consisting of two verbs, bite and die. But the difference is that the shared argument, the pig occurs between them. So you get a bite the pig and then die. And so it comes out as bit the pig dead. Bit the pig and made it dead, essentially. Or bit the pig and the pig died. I think that's actually the best way to parse that one. And so while analytic languages typically have the option between contiguous and non-contiguous serial verbs, synthetic languages tend to just have contiguous um, serial verbs, most often because it's a single word. And so in a single word SVC, most of the time you can't get anything intervening between those two verb components. And if a highly synthetic language does have its uh, serial verbs as separate words, so it has multi-word, SVCs, they tend to be strictly contiguous. So, even, so you would expect to see, uh, you would expect to see this in a synthetic language where the two, there's nothing between the verbs and you would not expect to see uh, anything intervening between them. So yeah, so if the language is synthetic, but it's SVCs involved phonologically uh, independent words, you would not expect anything to be able to occur between them. But that's exactly what we find in Hokuminum. So Hokuminum we describe because of the way it can stack more morphemes in a word, it's more synthetic, but it does utilize multi-word serial verb constructions and it allows them to be non-contiguous. 
So um, the shared subject NP may occur at the end of the verb phrase, like we have in this first one. So you can have contiguous SVCs. Um, but there's also the subject can occur between the two main verbs. So it's got multiple um, landing sites available to it. So these are the ways that Holcomitum is not a well-behaved serializing language. It's synthetic, uh, and it, but it lets other constituents occur between the verbs, and it puts the verbs at the front of clause. So next I wanna talk about one of the ways that it does behave like other serializing languages. And that is that this feature that it shares is that there's a lack of distinctness between prepositions and verbs. Um, and so how this is expressed in whole is there's actually only one preposition. They've got one multipurpose kind of oblique marker um, and verbs instead kind of fulfill the role that like we would see in English. And I have some English examples to talk about uh, first. So English makes extensive use of prepositions and particles in phrasal verbs. And so I like a lot of relationships in English are expressed using these kinds of little words. Um, for example, like the cat sat in under beside the box. Um, I can describe a lot of relationships in the real world using those little words. And then those phrasal verbs, um, like got out, got around, getting by, get in, like when does your plane get in? Each of those little particles changes the meaning of the verb. And so those kinds of relationships that we use these little words for in English are expressed through verbs. Um, and Hulkamenum. And so I'm going to next show you some fun Hulkamenum examples of that. Um, so I drew you some pictures and paint. You're welcome. Uh -huh. This is a, not, not what I'm getting my uh, PhD for, but um, yeah. yeah, the grip. Yeah, the, I didn't notice the glare on that. Um, okay, so the first one I want to talk about is the verb some. I'll play it for you so you know what it's actually supposed to sound like. And this verb means to go uphill or go up from water. And so you can some up from the water to your house or some up from, from your house up to the mountains. And I have an example of that one in action. Um, and so I'll play this one and you can hear it some hear uh, the speaker say it's on at the end. And so in this example, Tom provides the direction that the Sasquatch, who's the subject of this one, is running. Where in, as in English, I need a prepositional phrase up the hill. All of that is bundled into the verb. And so like you notice the sentence doesn't say anything about a hill or um, all that up and hill information is just bundled into the verb. Um, and then there's an op opposite verb um, where it means go downhill or go down to water. So you can, go, you can, I'll play that one so you know what he's supposed to sound like. So that's the one where she's really popping that adjective. Um, <clears throat> and so this one, in the same way, you can go down from the mountain to your house or down from your house to the water or to the beach. And, and and so I have one, this, this is another example of that in a sentence, a recording of this one. But in the same way, Tao pro provides the kind of direction that the subject is walking. And so in this case, in English, we need that kind of down and then to the beach prepositional phrase. Um, but in Hokumitnam, bundle it into the verb. I've got one more pair to show you. So this one, tall, and I'll let you hear that one as well. And that one means to leave shore or go out of the middle. And so you can either go out in the middle of a body of water or into the middle of a clearing. Um, it's also used when they're talking about coming to the center of the longhouse. Um, and so here's an example of that one. And I'll play that one. And tall's right in the middle. Um, and so here, again, Tal provides the direction the subject is swimming. 
Um, so in English, I would need to say far out on the water or going out to sea is a, a common translation of this one. Um, and Tal bundles up that information into our verb. And then it has an opposite, shale. Which means come, come to shore. And so they, in the same way, they use this one to mean um, leave the center, come to the side, or um, come to the side of the longhouse. Um, and I like, um, in this one, we see a lot in stories where characters being summoned to shore was like maybe the character's swimming or out on a canoe and they're being summoned back to shore. Um, and I especially like this one because first they say come ashore with meet, meet the sail. And then they say uh, come up from, so you can, you can kind of imagine them being up away from the water and they're like come to shore and then come up to where we are with meet some. So it really paints a, a visual picture, I think. So I hope uh, that part was fun and interesting. I uh, feel a little bit like, you know, telling a bit more about uh, Hokumitna. And now I'm going to focus on kind of what serial verbs are like in, in the language um, and present some examples of a, a common kind of uh, construction. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about motion events. Um, in the literature, a motion event is where one of the arguments changes location. Um, because of this, the concept of path is considered obligatory to a, the description of a motion event. In this case, um, I'm not talking about motions like spinning or uh, bouncing or fidgeting or shaking. Um, so these are these are specifically translational motion um, where it involves a change of location. Um, and then another dimension of the motion event is manner. And manner is not considered definitional to a motion event. Um, it's often considered extra information. Um, and manners range from general, like we've seen, like walk, run, or fly, or more specific, limp, sprint, swoop. And the most common type of motion serial verb construction cross-linguistically are directional serial verb constructions, which consist of a motion and a direction verb. And so the directional verb contributes path of motion, that like kind of necessary information. Um, and the other verb adds manner. For example, in this one, so again, the directional verb contributes the path of motion. So the, the first verb, the gives us um, the path. And then the second verb, uh, gives us the manner. And I thought it interesting if we think about a more natural way for an English, because like the translation is, is kind of choppy and literal. A more natural way for an English speaker to describe this event would be to say something like, the boy walked away. And so here um, in English, our, we put the manner on the main verb, and then our path is always encoded by like a satellite element. So either, a, in this case, an adverb, but like those phrasal verbs by those um, kind of directional prepositions. Um, in addition to path and manner, uh, directional verbs can also be combined with one another. And so in this example, Tau gives us our trajectory, kind of like, because you, you can see it uh, heading downhill, and then the Ewa, the second verb, tells us where they're going, what's, what's at the bottom once they go downhill. In the text corpus, uh, the, so we've seen this verb a couple times so far, Hayet, which means leave or depart. Um, so when this one occurs with other motion verbs, it's always first. We're almost always first when it's serialized. So I'll play that one just so we can hear another example. And so in this case, the, the wren is flying away. Um, but other directional verbs actually prefer to occur second. And so in this, in contrast with Hayet, um, other verbs like talk, in this, in this that one means go home, um, typically occurs as the second verb in the construction. I'll let you hear that one too. There's a little pause after the first word, but the rest is coming. And so that's um, actually a little bit more common for these verbs so to have the path verb second. Oh, and this is just one more example. So tall, that go out to see verb we saw earlier also tends to occur second. And then there's a there's a there's a number of them that are fairly flexible. And so, sorry, this slide's a little busy, but 
um, a lot of them can can switch with the manner verb. So I have the same verb verbs in both. In the first one, we have run, quick genum, and some. And so you get manner path. And in the second one, you get some quick genum. And both orders are allowable and they don't profoundly impact the meaning at all. And so um, in literature, if we're looking at serial verb constructions, um, cross-linguistically, it's actually much more common to get path second, so manner path. Um, when Roth, Lovestone and Ross did a survey of serializing languages, they found that 90% of the languages that had directional SVCs preferred that order. And so as we're looking at um, it would it's a, it makes sense that we would find them in that order. And so what I did was survey the different kinds of constructions that we have um, and came up with this table. And so what this is, is a corpus count of a handful of directional verbs that often occur in this type of construction. Um, and so the first column gives us the, the verb. And then the second column is whether it occurs path, so whether it occurs first, so path manner. And then the second column is whether it occurs second, manner path. Um, and I think the most important things to point out, and they're kind of grouped this way, um, is Haye is the only one that likes to be first. Um, and then the second grouping, the next four basically, um, those ones are flexible and they occur in the text corpus, um, both first and second. And then you have the next group that basically occurs second. And so um, I wanted to zoom in on a couple of them. So Paye is the, the kind of the, the weirdo um, in that it, 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 first of all, occurs more than any of the other ones. Um, there's 40 total cases of it occurring with another verb. And in, I'm oh, sorry, 41, and then in 40 of those cases, <clears throat> it occurs first. Whereas some and top are the next two most common, and they occur half as many times each. Um, and then they also have a, a preference, you can see, like for occurring second, but it's a little more flexible. So what I think is happening is we actually have two diverging constructions forming here. Um, on one hand, we have a construction with Hayet that has a more fixed word order. Um, and then on the other hand, we have a directional serial verb construction with flexible order where there's a preference for having uh, generically a directional verb second. And so I think Hayet is changing. Um, and so if you haven't heard this, this word before, grammaticalization, it's the um, involves the a construction <clears throat> involves a construction with a particular lexical or semantic me, uh, morpheme becoming a grammatical morpheme, and <clears throat> and what this means is that the, the semantic meaning is bleaching out of it, um, and it's developing a grammatical function. And so my question is: Is Hayet a direction this directional verb in the process of grammaticalizing? And I have an English example to kind of illustrate what is similar to what I think what might be happening. So in English, we have a construction um, with a movement verb and a purpose clause. So like I'm, I'm going to see the king. Um, and so it's made up of a progressive verb and an infinitive clause. And so you've got, I'm going to see the king, I'm traveling to see the king, I'm riding to see the king. These all mean I'm changing location in order to go see, in order to meet with the king. But one of these is grammaticalized and the other others haven't. So some more examples in A, I'm going to see the king. This means I will see him, but I don't necessarily have to change location to do it. I could be sitting on the side of the road and he could ride by and then, uh, and then I, that's when I would see him. Similarly, I'm going to eat a sandwich. Just means I'm going, I plan to eat a sandwich in the future. It's, it no longer encodes movement. I don't have to go anywhere to eat the sandwich. Um, so what's happening is going to has lost lexical meaning, encoding the idea of movement, and has been boiled down to a grammatical morpheme mean, indicating future. In fact, in C, um, we can have go twice, and it's not redundant or repetitive. I'm going to go see the king just means I am going to change location to see the king in the future. Um, and I think it's funny if you think about, if you try to do this with the other ones, like I'm traveling to travel on vacation or I'm riding to ride a horse. Like those ones, like, you're like, why would you say like, why would you say it twice? Um, but you don't get that kind of like weird feeling with go because it's bleached. 
And so um, there's a similar construction in Hulk Um, So you've got an, uh, the word nem occurs as both an auxiliary um, and a full verb in the language. And so you can kind of see that when they both occur at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I'll play it for you just so you can hear it, but he says it pretty fast. Um, and so this kind of construction is similar to the English I'm going to go. You've got um, where the second nem in the middle there um, is the one that gives you kind of that motion, that change of location. So I'm gonna go visit Sparrow in this case. And so in both languages, the first go has, has lost some of its semantic weight and taken on a grammatical function. And so what I wanted to try next to see is, is that happening to Haye or where are we at in this process? And so I asked my consultant if I could say it like this, um, with Haye and then Haye again. Um, and she didn't like it. Um, she, she's like, you could say it in the same way you could say, I'm riding to ride a horse. Like she's like, people might say it like that, but I wouldn't. Um, and she wanted me to put nem in instead of hayet for the first one. And so I think this sounds weird because it's uh, repetitive. Um, and, and that first hayet has not developed an auxil a full auxiliary function. Um, and then to kind of back this up, um, there's no cases where this actually happens in the text corpus. Um, they don't they 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 don't talk like that, um, as she said. Um, but there are over 40 cases of NEM doing this. And so there's a, there's a clear case where NEM has been extended to lots of different contexts, whereas Hye is still restricted to um, movement and motion type contexts. Um, and so to kind of where I think we're at in the process is that um, we have two constructions, as I said earlier. But, and so Hye and another verb is developing into an asymmetrical serial verb construction, whereas the ones with more flexible and interchangeable pieces are it would be a symmetrical directional serial verb construction. And an asymmetrical serial verb construction is characterized by having fixed word order, so that's one of the things we would expect to see. Um, and what these are is they're comprised comprised of a minor verb that is from a closed subclass of verbs, and then a major component which comes from a more open class. And so that that second piece, the second part of the construction is more interchangeable, but you've got one that's a little bit more set. And so in this case, the minor component is restricted to just Haye. Um, I haven't found any other verbs that do it do this. Um, and then you can get Haye with all sorts of other verbs. So to wrap up, um, Holcomitnam doesn't fit the typological profile of most serializing languages um, in that it's verb initial and synthetic, and it does allow non-contiguous SVCs. When describing motion events, path and manner are each expressed on the verb. Um, and then a directional SVCs can be divided into two groups, one with fixed order, a yate plus a verb, and then one with flexible order, a manner verb and a path verb with a preference for the path verb being second. Um, and a little bit about what I'm currently working on. Um, there's still puzzles to sort out, lots of work to do. It's um, lots of fun to be had. Um, so syntax, first of all, um, so one of the things I've been puzzling recently is that verb, uh, verb initial languages are well documented in syntactic literature and serial verb languages are well documented in syntactic literature, but because they don't usually overlap, they're, they're, there's not a lot of puzzling over how that even works. And so I've been playing around with syntactic trees and it's going. Um, and then um, another puzzle is intonation and prosody because serialized, serialized verbs are expected, like with intonation contours and everything to act like clauses with one verb. Um, and so that's another thing, a whole experiment I need to run. Um, and then finally, uh, there's lots to play around with more with meaning because obviously this presentation and a lot of my work so far has been focused on motion um, because those are more, more common, but there are other types in the language. And typologically, it's common for serial verb constructions to express uh, posture, state, resultative, and comparative meanings. And so there's a couple more puzzles to sort out there as well. Um, and to before I finish, a few more acknowledgments. So first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is so fun. Um, 
And additionally, I wanted to point out that the text corpus I work out of would not be possible without the work of all those who recorded, transcribed, translated, and proofread. And so a lot of work has gone into building that resource. And so I wanted to shout out to all of those people who contributed. Additionally, none of this work would be possible without funding. And so um, I listed some of the people who've also, or the organizations that have made that possible. And finally, um, all those little objective recordings were um, done by Maida Percival. And so I want to thank her for letting me use those. And if you want to look at references, I, I can make those available to you. Uh, that's all, thank you.